So we'll get started. It's bang on 10 a.m. And to honor those who have joined us really early, um, know my heart and my welcome to our first clinical practice webinar of 2019. Um, we're quite excited. This is a different way of doing webinars where we're not broadcasting to everyone. We're making it quite specific for our sector and to the specific needs and workforce development um, requirements that people in crisis services as well as those working directly with children might need. Um, so this has come from lots of different Zoom hoos that you all, I know, participated over the last couple of years. Um, so welcome, warm welcome. I'm at the moment in uh, Te Whanganui Atatara and we're um, in Wellington, and we're joined by the amazing team of START in um, Ota, Ototahi um, over in Christchurch. I'm going to hand over to them to do all the intros, and I'll be available on the chat if anyone has any technical issues. Do get on the chat um, to make sure that you can ask questions because we have a few different breaks throughout the webinar where you can, um, the, the wonderful people from START will be available to ask direct questions, and then we'll close the PowerPoint at the end and do a Q&A at the very end. So kia ora and handing over to you. Uh, nā mihi mahana, kia koutou katoa. It's uh, Maggie Tairakana here uh, from START. I'm the manager here. I just need to preface our session this morning by saying it's our first webinar. So um, we'll be doing our best, but please excuse us if the technology chops us up. Or we trip ourselves up. Yeah, so that's probably yes, that too. Mm. So I'm Maggie and we've got Catherine Gallagher who's our clinical practice manager and Joe Barda who's our social worker here today. Um, so I thought I'd start actually and talk, we'll talk about what, who start and what we do in a minute, but we thought we'd start by talking about it on, um, what the context is for the children's work that we're doing here in Christchurch. And the local services are a bit of a jigsaw puzzle and far from perfect, but this is how it kind of works, this is how it fits together. So um, the local uh, CDHB, the hospital, have a child um, sexual violence response 24-7. They're particularly focused on those 13 and under and they have a social worker attached there and so they can respond to the children's needs at the hospital and it's for um, anyone can make referrals into that. But we are under, in conversations with them about extending that because it's a little limited and it's a resourcing problem. So um, that's something to be navigated. Uh, the other uh, response locally for adults in the crisis space is SAS, who uh, we partner with, and we welcome those who are here today from SAS. Um, and so that's focused on the adults, but needless to say, they have quite a number of adolescents who would turn up at their door. And they provide the usual uh, phone supports and go to the MEDSAC um, examinations and uh, uh, with the police when they're doing some of their talking about um, some of the crisis space. So the other thing we have is Cambridge Clinic, which is the specialist MEDSAC clinic here in Christchurch, and they will see all ages in specialise in forensic examinations. Um, Wairana Tamariki and uh, the Police Child Protection Team share a unit here in Christchurch and they work very closely together and we work very closely with them. So that's a daily relationship for us and um, we'll talk about this a bit later on but we work with children who have had uh, evidential so we're in uh, a lot of contact with that particular uh, workforce. Um, the other thing that's on offer is the Safe to Talk helpline, which you all know about, which is available for all ages throughout the country and 24-7, and they're available to give support to our parents. So, um, so who are we and what do we do? I guess we wanted to just think about what we would look to achieve today is to um, explore our approach, and we know that we probably do this a little differently to how some other people would do it, but it's an approach that we've developed over uh, more than 30 years and what we have um, what we believe works. So that's the approach that we've adopted and so we're just here to talk a little bit about what, what we've come up with um, and the rationale for that and I guess to give opportunity for you to ask your questions and also to think a bit more even just about that word crisis. What does that mean when you're thinking about children? So, um, what a start offer. We've got um, consultations for all ages. That's a service we've always provided. 
And so under the new contract for the crisis area for children, um, that is our consultation service. So we call it consultation uh, MSD, think of it as a crisis service. We provide our crisis service in, 20, in office hours, so within the nine to five normal Monday to Friday. So we make no pretense that we're offering this uh, out of hours, and that's to do with our capacity and our ability to respond. Um, so people contact us by phone, um, they can ring in for a face-to-face -face, uh, opportunity. Sometimes it's webinars, sometimes it's Skype, Zooms, all sorts of electronic methods because sometimes people are contacting us internationally and in other cities of New Zealand. So that's one of our services and Joe's our mainstay in that way. Um, so we also provide community education, I guess opportunities a bit like this, but we are in a wide variety of settings and that's all request driven and trying to think of um, ways to support people to think about sexual violence, about trauma, trauma-informed practice, and um, thinking about the prevention of sexual violence. So uh, that's a big piece of work that we're engaged in and, and tailor-make packages. So we also provide ACC accredited counselling, uh, which is our main day job. That's the biggest thing we do, and we do that for all ages and all genders and all ethnicities that might choose us. Bearing in mind that we have a Kaupapa Māori service in Christchurch called Te Puna Orana. Um, so that's another option. Um, and we also have a male focused service in Christchurch too. So we have social work, which is um, Jo's leading that piece of work. Um, she's ACC accredited. So an amount of the social work is covered by ACC, but it's a tiny portion really. That's just almost a red hearing. Um, a lot of the social work is around the triage, these consultations, um, parenting guidance, uh, advocacy, getting people referred into other services and, and helping them troubleshoot all around this whole big issue, really. Um, advocacy is another piece of work that STAR is involved in very actively in both locally and nationally, and we're involved in a lot of collaborative efforts towards that goal. So it's um, a space that we keep ourselves reasonably busy in. We provide some group work, um, those have been for teen girls in particular and for parents and so providing some opportunities for parents to meet other parents and to get some psychoeducation have been really important but it's actually quite difficult to get people interested in coming along to such a group, it's not a topic people rush for. Um, other group things that we do is we do some camps for both boys and girls uh, separately with the police and we've done those every year for at least a decade, um, and they're really important pieces of work as well. And so the other part of our repertoire is the um, partnership with Aviva to provide the SAS, which is the crisis adult service here in Christchurch. So um, this is an opportunity to ask some questions if there's any just about kind of local setting and about our agency before we move on to um, talking about how we approach this piece of work. So. Miriam, will you be telling us about any questions people have got? So, <clears throat> thank you everyone for um, getting busy in the chat. For those who haven't um, introduced themselves, please jump in and it's the icon at the bottom of the video with the little speech bubble that allows you to get into the chat. I've seen some pe um, one person experimenting with the question and answer box as well that is available too. Either one is fine. At the moment there aren't any specific questions, but if people do have specific questions, Put them in the chat right now and we can answer them. The other question I have asked in the chat is, um, you know, just is there anything um, people want to make sure this topic covers just so that you can have that in, in the back of your mind as you weave through your presentation? Um, so for those who are asking, can you hear us? Um, the webinar function is very different in the sense that you can only view and chat, but we can't hear you or see you. And that's just to be able to ensure that the presenters don't get distracted and that's part of the webinar function. But um, when we do the Q&A, we can allow um, participants to actually speak. So we'll, we'll explore that because it's quite a small group today. We might explore that in the final Q&A. So at the moment, Q&As are all typed in. So at the moment, you don't have any Q&As, but we can stop in a few moments when you get to the next question and answer pause.
Okay, well, I'll move right along. I realise I forgot to say that um, I'm a registered social worker. Joe's a registered social worker and Catherine is a clinical psychologist. We have a, a wide variety in our team of different um, qualifications and backgrounds. But anyway, this is the three people here today. So over to Catherine now. Okay. So we thought that, I mean, you've obviously signed up because you're interested to hear about the crisis response for children. And a really important question to answer is what do we actually mean when we say child? Um, because I think that um, there are a whole lot of factors that can play into that. And one of the factors can be that we can all assume that we're talking about the same thing. So it's always good to spend some time clarifying that. When we think about what is a child, well, you know, it's interesting to think where do we look for that information? And, you know, an obvious place is to, to beyond our own assumptions, is to look to what the law says. And this is a bit of an interesting um, space because the New Zealand law, um, the Children and Young Persons Act and various other laws, actually don't have agreement around what they define as a child. Um, so there is voting at 18, there's drinking at 18, there's, you can go to the GP without need for parental consent at 16, you can have sex at 16. So it's not really clear in terms of, of what is um, the law defined as a child. So we looked up um, the United Nations Conventions of Rights of the Child, um, so the world definition, UNCROC, which I thought was an interesting acronym. <laughs> anyway, and they define, as you see here, that the child means every human being below the age of 18. So unless the law um, of the land applicable to that child, a majority has attained earlier. So it's probably an interesting place to start. I think that the, what we tend to operate, and that sort of fits with the Oromata Mariki's um, gambit, because typically, um, well, in the past that was below the age of 17, and now that's been extended to 18. So that's kind of where START operates from in terms of defining children and young people. As you can imagine, though, a two-year-old, a six-year-old, and a 10-year-old, and a 16-year-old, and a 17-year-old are going to have a whole lot of different issues going on for them. And so this is one of the things that I think, um, you know, can absolutely add spice to this work, um, but also add, obviously, complexity. So we're looking at chronological age as one factor, and obviously that's what the law takes into account. But clearly there's going to be developmental age differences. So you can have two 10-year-olds, two 16-year-olds who, um, you know, on the face of it, given their birth dates, are going to have, you know, potentially the same issues going on. But because of other factors, because of their developmental stage, because of their family system, all those other sorts of things, are going to have some very different needs. And I suppose that's the kind of thing that we're having to always look at case by case. And with regard to developmental age, um, it's an interesting one because obviously... Um, Biologically and neurologically, um, children can have some issues which mean that they are, um, you know, functioning at a different age um, and, and um, have issues going on for them. But I also think in modern society, uh, well, actually in any society, you're going to have two 16-year-olds who, because of the lives they lead, are also going to be developmentally in very different stages. So for some 16-year-olds who live independently, who um, are out there working, who, you know, have, have their own way of transporting themselves, um, that's very different from some 16-year-olds who remain very much in the family nest. So those are the kinds of factors we're wanting to take into account. And that, I suppose, leads into our next um, comment there around the family system, because I think that, you know, obviously how this particular family does family, does relationship, um, is going to um, be influential in terms of who we're wanting to work with. And, of course, as you well know, some family systems are not safe family systems. So you may well have um, family systems where, in fact, um, you know, it's not helpful for the child to be getting help within that family system. Obviously, that's a rarity. Well, in the fact that we will still try and engage some aspect of that family system and try and make sense of it, because hopefully there's some help at some stage. Also, for some kids, their family systems aren't biological. You know, they're going to be links through, um, you know, other people in their world and for some of them their family system is actually a professional family system because that's who they've got around them who are the safe people. The other factor is going to be relationship with the person who harmed them because I think in some situations um, you know if, if a, a 17 year old comes to a school counsellor and says look I you know something happened at a party um, 
how we deal with that factor, you know, that that situation may well be different compared to a 17 or a 16 year old who comes to us and says, look, it's actually my uncle or my dad or my auntie or my grandma who's doing this. And so all of those factors, um, I think again are about, one of the things I often say with regard to this work is, this work is complex um, and we need to honour that complexity, but try and not get overwhelmed by it. Um, because fundamentally it's good clinical practice to sit down and, and not make assumptions um, and look at the people and the person in front of you and, and be informed by that. Related to that other comment, obviously urgency and risk are going to impact on you know, who we're working with um, because if there's, the child can't go home or the young person can't go home because the risk is imminent, um, that may well require a very different piece of work than someone who's telling us something historical um, and they're wanting some support around it. Does anyone have anything to add about that? Yeah, and I think the urgency um, can, that sense of urgency can really vary from small children mm -hmm. into adolescents. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how you might observe um, crisis in children and adolescents, and that can be quite different. So. You know, we might encounter adolescents really acting out quite a lot. Uh, and for them, you know, it, if we can get them into some sort of support early, mm -hmm. then, that's, um, then that's good. That can often really um, mitigate some of those other um, behaviours that they're engaging in. With smaller kids, with younger kids, and we'll talk about this a bit further on as well, this, the urgency you get into counselling is often the parents, not the child. Mm -hmm. Uh, because very often for smaller kids, uh, once they disclose, um, it, they there's a sense often that there's a burden or a secret that's lifted, and so often they can settle a little bit mm. uh, after that initial disclosure. So, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit further on, but it, it, it looks different across the age range, as you'd expect. And I think that's the bit that we, we need to, which I'm sure if you work in this area, you're well aware of, but I think one of the things that we often find with working with children is quite often adult frames of reference are, are kind of put out there and um, children are seen as being just a trickle down from that. So we can kind of use those same ideas or same models or same approaches and just, um, yeah, trickle down or adjust it to do with the child. I suppose what we experience is actually children need some very different approaches. And children, as we're just saying, are, are not a, 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 a um, homogenous group. And so I think when funders look at ways of working and organisations look at ways of working, we have to be able to honour the fact that um, this, is a, you know, this is a large group um, with different needs. Yeah. And as said with jo what Joe was saying, that's pretty much... Um, if, you, if your expectation was that we were going to talk about, you know, one-on-one -on -one work with the children, the talk we're doing today frames up how we um, see that a bit differently because, in fact, we see children as living within that system. Yeah. So what does a crisis look like in a child? Um, well, you know, I'd like to be able to have a tick box <laughs> and say, you know, if you tick all these um, boxes, then, booyah, you've got a child in crisis. The challenge is we're all going to respond differently to crisis, and of course that includes children. Um, and we can also respond similarly to different experiences. So, you know, we're not all the same, and that's the beauty of human nature, but it can also mean that we don't always know what we're looking at. So it can be really helpful to have some clues. The clues, you know, children can show a change in behaviour or unexpected behaviour. So, you know, again, um, I think a lot of times when you see lists of a child, you know, who's been traumatised, they may well have, you know, spoiling or they may well have, um, you know, sleep disturbance or they may well have, you know, not eating or whatever. Some kids have never eaten well. You know, some kids have got a tummy bug and that's why they've gone off their food. So there are a whole lot of reasons why there can be changes in behaviour. And so simply a change in behaviour isn't going to make us jump to a conclusion that this child's been traumatised. But I suppose our big you know, our message is that it's about stopping and paying attention because a change in behaviour indicates that something's going on. Yeah? So children can become dysregulated. Um, well, in effect, you know, you could argue that we're, we're all designed to become dysregulated. You know, our nervous systems are designed to react to our environments. And so, in fact, we're 
pretty much born knowing how to do dysregulation and it's the learning regulation which takes some time and practice. But clearly um, in these kinds of situations, children may well be showing behaviours where they're easily triggered by reminders or stresses or to the other extreme, shut off, flat and withdrawn. So that's the kind of stuff which can be um, more obvious and, and stand out. Um, so, so those can be some things that people are looking for. The other clue might be that something has happened and we as the adults in that child's world can make an assumption. And so we actually go towards that issue or go towards that child and start asking questions. The other clue can be that the children around the child are in crisis. And as Joe was saying, often with little kids, um, they might have told or, um, or they might actually not have told. Um, and there can be lots of reasons why children won't tell. And we can talk a wee bit about that if people are interested. Um, but the adults start to freak out and start to worry about this child and start to think about what's happened. And so that can be a clue um, that actually we need to pay some more attention to this child. Or, as you'll see at the bottom, we don't see anything at all. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and, you know, certainly I sat with a situation the other week where an adult has come into our service and she was actually a, a child who I saw when I worked in the mental health service. And at the time, um, we've shown a whole lot of behaviours that were explained by other staff. I now know that she was having the experience of sexual violence right when I was seeing her. So those are the kinds of things which are never scenarios we feel comfortable with and so it's, very, um, you know, it's a very difficult thing to, to acknowledge. But we often don't see because we're not looking for it. And I think parents explain it away as yeah, well, you know, yeah. as as we're all parents here yeah. and, and some of you may be as well, that, you know, things change in your child's behaviour or they start um, doing things a little differently. That, you know, as Catherine said, that's not the first place that we immediately leap to. Mm -hmm. So sometimes for quite a long period of time, uh, parents can, um, uh, I guess, They've made some assumptions themselves or they just kind of explain it away based on other stuff that's going on or they make excuses for it or it's probably this or it's probably that. And so that, that can go on for quite a while, I think, before mm -hmm. it reaches that what you might call crisis point. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the big thing is to be paying attention. And one of the challenges we have with our consults um, in that crisis space can be sometimes parents are coming along and going, we think something's happened, um, you know, the child's coming home from access or coming home from this situation and is distressed, mm. but is not talking. Mm. And so can you talk to the child and sort of, you know, find out what's going on? Mm. And I think that's a, that's a really challenging scenario because, you know, obviously we want to be really careful with, with going towards um, checking in with child children directly about what's happened. Um, and if people are interested, we can do some talking around handling disclosures, you know, because it's, it's maybe a topic for another day. But um, that whole idea of how do you create an environment or support parents to create an environment where children feel more likely to be able to tell. And even doing that, some children won't tell. Um, and so we're having to support them around um, this without actually having them, you know, told of telling us directly. So how do we know it's a sexual violence crisis? And, you know, I mean, this is stating the obvious, but typically this stuff happens in private. Um, people don't tend to advertise it. So very rarely someone will see. So someone walks in on something or, or sees some behaviour they're concerned about or, or um, sees a text or sees a picture. Or another child sees it. Or another well. child sees it. Um, someone hears about it. So, you know, a child might tell a friend and, and, and that friend might tell a parent. And so there's kind of like a bit of, um, you know, the whispers around how this might end up being heard by someone who can then do something about it. Someone tells. And again, I think, um, you know, for a lot of children, as I've just been talking about, and young people and adults, the telling part can be very really difficult. And certainly we would notice disclosure as being a really significant part. So even if the abuse might have happened years ago or, or a long time ago, another crisis point will be disclosure because that's, as Joe was saying, can be a, an absolute lifting of, of the weight of the secret. But the ripple effects, as you can imagine, can be pretty profound. And so for some kids, um, that, that will provoke a crisis because they can be worried about what people are going to do and say. They have to talk to the police. You know, families can be ripped apart. So you can see how there's a lot of ripple effects to this. Um, that aren't actually 
specifically about what happened to them, but it's about what happens as a result of what happened to them. Sometimes it's known because something will appear electronically. Yep. Mm. So there might be some film material that can't yep. be seen. You know. yep. yeah. We certainly had a client the other day where the police turned up on the doorstep mm. um, and, and you know, had found out that piece of information. So I suppose that links into that next point about concerning behaviour. So if kids are doing things like sending pictures or acting in a sexualised way, again, this does not mean, you know, that they have been sexually abused, but it's another, it's a concerning behaviour that's important to check in with. Um, you know, yeah, I think we'd like the litmus test. We'd like to be able to say, well, you know, what behaviour might be shown so that we know sexual violence has happened. We don't know. Um, so what we're often doing is putting together the puzzle picture, um, pieces. The other reason we might know it's a sexual violence crisis is those supporting the child can feel overwhelmed. So, you know, the child might actually be kind of doing okay, but in fact mum and dad or, or whoever is in that child's world start to feel as though their resources and their capacity to manage this um, is getting overwhelmed, so they may well present for help. Um, as the next point says, the police or the tamariki or the court process gets in the way. So the agenda becomes someone else, someone else's. So again, the crisis um, may well be because they have to go to court. Might have nothing to do with the child's process, but in fact, there's, a, there's another timetable um, that's having an impact. Or again, we simply don't know that it's a sexual violence crisis. We can assume, we can wonder, but um, we're left in that grey area. So I think this is another point with questions. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has any questions about that. Also even comments about uh, how we're talking and the speed of what we're saying and, and yeah, mm -hmm. any feedback would be good because we, we've still got half to be able to change things up a wee bit. Um, the only um, suggestion I would give is uh, a little bit louder um, because you're okay. a little bit far away from the mic. Um, really interesting points. There is a, a quite a nice meaty question for you, which is, how do you go about seeking consent from young people, in particular, um, meaning those who are under 17? And that's from Andrea. So I imagine that's in terms of, and Andrea, type in in the chat if I'm getting the question wrong, but um, um, I imagine that's about attending sessions um, in terms of how do you go about, you know, if a young person wants to seek support through your services, where do you draw the line and how do you do that? Yeah, uh, so a couple of things sort of spring to mind. Um, what we haven't talked about here thus far is the criteria that we have for children or young people entering into START service. Entering into our therapy service. Yeah, so entering into our therapy. Process service. Into therapy, yeah. So um, when we're dealing with with children and young people, our, our sort of gold standard, I guess, is that they have had an evidential interview and we have an agreement with the child protection team here that we receive a summary copy of that. So it's not the um, verbatim or the video, it's just a one or two page summary of what's happened. Um, and, you know, I can talk about the rationale for that if, if you're interested in that. And if we can't get that, we like to at least have had them disclosed to someone outside the family and for that to have been recorded. So at the, whether that be to Oranga Tamariki, sometimes it's to mental health services. Um, GP, uh, and we've got we've got something to um, you know a hook to hang the, the therapeutic work on. Um, so they would have already gone through a process um, before coming to us anyway that would have um, dealt with some of those consent issues. What has happened, and what um, occasionally happens, is when it's a young person, it, it's a bit that kind of 16, 17 age group. Can, is definitely one of those grey areas. Um, and as Catherine's talked about, those young people often have a, um, a lot more sense of agency than, than younger kids. What has happened occasionally is where they have gone and spoken to a school counsellor and said, this is what's happened or I need to talk about this, and the school counsellor's got in contact with us. And it's become apparent at that point that they haven't spoken to their family. Um, they haven't told their parent or caregiver. Um, so you're absolutely right, it's a good question to ask because that does come up, That's, that absolutely comes up. So in, in that instance, when that's happened, um, I usually work with the school counsellor 
to have those conversations with the young person about why it's important for uh, the significant adult in their life to know about this. Um, and what has happened is I've had school counsellors or um, social workers bring a young person in for a consult in the first instance. Because so I find if we can get them through, across the threshold, through the door, and we can just sit down and have a conversation about what this process looks like and why it's important that there is support, that there's a, uh, a soft landing for those young people um, outside of the therapeutic process, and, and I'll talk about that a wee bit further on. Um, so it, we, you know, we work, we work with that and we'll have conversations about how they can have um, that conversation with the adult in their life. Obviously, if there is immediate risk, then that needs to be addressed and, you know, that can happen either through us or through the, the person that they're speaking to, whether it be a school social worker or a school counsellor or whoever, the immediate risk is addressed. Um, if it's not safe for them to be at home or if the, what's happened is ongoing, then obviously you know, all those same rules apply in terms of ethics and um, responsibility and that sort of thing. But if it's just that, um, you know, that they're not in any danger, but they've been carrying around, often often where this has cropped up is where it's been historic. So when it might have happened in their childhood and now in their adolescence, it's risen to the surface and is getting in the way of everyday life. So um we just sort of talk that through really and, and work that through because one of the in terms of the other criteria we have is that um that that children or young people have had an evidential that they're in a stable, settled as much as possible, um, living environment and that they've got a good supportive adult who will attend to the counselling process with them. And that doesn't mean that the adult's in every session with them, but it is that soft landing. So uh, it's really important and, and I'll mention this later on too that there is that person um in their life so so we work with it yeah and i think one of the things that's important with regard to children is that you know if you're someone who um i mean clearly it's really important to respect someone's autonomy and you know to hear their voice i think as joe was saying though if, if a child or a young person goes no i don't want anyone to know we also have to think about those developmental stages and um, what we also know is going to help that person heal and be safe. So that's not saying we're taking some paternalistic or kind of, you know, overarching kind of view. But if you're 15 or 16, then in fact there are some things that are going to help you heal and part of that is going to be engaging your support network. And so reasons why kids won't want parents to know, I mean, they're, they're numerous, mm. but some of them can be about shame, can be about fears that they're going to get in trouble, can be fears that, that they're going to be judged. And so rather than take the no, I don't want anyone to know as being their final answer, it becomes a, a piece of, of work mm. around, mm. okay, tell me why and, and, and how can we work with that and who might be someone who um, we could tell that that would feel a little bit more mm. comfortable. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to realise that they have different needs um, and, and have different reliance and often have less power in their world. And we need to see that world realistically rather than through our lens mm. as being black and white. Okay, if they say no one needs to know, we need to respect that. Because I think that can get us into some trouble. Yeah, and what support do they need to be able to tell? Yeah. So, you know, what, what might that look like? It's, you know, they don't have to necessarily front that on their own. I just want to make a couple of comments too about the consent issue for us is when people are referring into our service on our referral form that ask for the consent of the legal guardian or the adult that's in charge but also of the young person. Um, so we're seeking to make a verb and we want the kids to have to say about that. And even if in due course later on the children might come into counselling because an adult thinks that that's good, um, the child will still have a say about whether they're going to be involved. And if after some sessions that's, you know, they're, they're really adamant they don't want to borrow this council and nonsense, um, they have a say about them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're, we're respecting their autonomy, but also being realistic about the developmental um, capacity they have at various stages to make those big decisions. Um, is there any other questions? Any other questions? I'm aware that, that obviously we work in the in the actual therapy space as well as the crisis space. So we'll try and um, yeah be clear about what we're talking about because certainly the criteria Joe was talking about in terms of evidential 
and um, having a parent and those sorts of things involved are relevant, obviously, for coming in to start. But in the crisis space, it may well be someone just rings or someone texts or emails. Um, and so those certainly wouldn't be barriers for someone coming in to see us. Um, you know, and sometimes actually in that crisis space, we're looking at how do they fulfil those criteria and how to support them to do so. Great. At the moment there, um, the feedback was, that was awesome feedback and thank you. Um, so the at the moment, I'm collecting my own questions, but I think I'll just launch them through at the end. Um, so kind of thinking through what you're saying. One, The only um, question I have before we move on, because I know we're kind of moving away, is um, you talked at the very beginning about, about complexity and urgency of this work. I'm just wondering if you can briefly give some pointers for those who are online of what organisational systems and structures you have in place. Like, what are, If you had like a top three tips to make sure that the workers on the front line are well supported to be able to work with children in this space. Throwing you on this. Um, I mean, I think that they need to know children. So, so a lot of, in terms of support, um, a big part of this is training and expertise in knowing children, knowing family systems. So I think we all do better when we feel competent um, and confident in the actual work that we're doing and so if you're someone who doesn't have that training but has been expected to do that work that doesn't feel sustainable or safe so training and, and specialist support around doing this work because it is a unique area it's not just something you can do alongside oh yep I work with adults so of course I can work with kids so I think that's one thing know your limits know your limits mm. um, and, and ask for more training around this stuff because Obviously, to understand working with, with violence and trauma, you need to know what normal development also looks like. Because otherwise, we can look at something and go, well, that doesn't, you know, this six year old's losing the plot. That's not okay. But in fact, most six year olds lose the plot. I mean, most, most 46 year olds lose the, lose the plot. Like, what does normal children, um, children's behavior and those things look like? So that's also a really helpful part. Um, I mean, as cl clinical practice manager, a big, big part of this is um, the team um, supporting each other. So supervision and, and backup time. Because when an adult comes in, often we're dealing with that one person and that person's perception of their social supports. When a child turns up, they often turn up, again, as we say, often ideally, with their support system. So, and that support system might also have their own needs. So... We're often finding that, that in working with children and families, um, the, the, the clinician needs to be resourced with time to be able to, to um, pay attention to some of that stuff, to be able to link other agencies in. What would you say to that, Joe? Yeah. Um, have to know the wider system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, have good networks. and it, Because I think what can happen is that if we get that, receive that phone call, we, can, um, we have to be really mindful of not catching the crisis ourselves. And... Um, Obviously, we want to respond in a timely fashion. We want to be able to contain people and stabilise them uh, in that moment. But also, if we need to buy ourselves a little bit of time, to, um, because there, there can be a real temptation of seduction into going, oh, right, I need to rescue this situation right now. And so I think um, if we can contain someone, but also to be able to um, kind of hold them and say, look, there are some things here that I'm, I'm going to need to get back to you on. And even if you just buy yourself an hour to be able to um, get some supervision or debrief or say to some, you, you know, your, your um, colleague, okay, where do I go with this? And then call back. Um, so I think that's important to, to, to know. I'm just aware that we've got um, 20 minutes and lots of really good content to go through. So, Joe, should we move on? And can we save some of those questions to the end? Maria? I was just about to say exactly the same thing, so yes. Oh, okay. So over to you, Jo. Okay, great. Uh, so as we've already alluded to, really, and you would have worked out by now. Um, it's a dog with a bone. <laughs> yeah, is that when we're talking about kids uh, in crisis, mostly what we're talking about is the adult in their life having the crisis. So not to, not to minimise and say that the child isn't having a crisis, but primarily we work with the adult. And so this is a wee bit about why do we do that? Why do we work with the, the adult if a child is in crisis? 
and it might seem pretty straightforward, but um, it, it, it is really important. So as we've got there, you know, a child in crisis needs that safety and stability. They need an anchored adult. So very often the calls that I might take if a child is, is really um, distressed is the adult has kind of become a bit untethered in that space as well. Um, they have panicked. And really, I think um, but when, in the, the parent work that Catherine and I have done, I, I would say, and I mean, you can chip in on this, that very often um, when we talk with the parents about what some of their worries and fears are, although every individual situation is different, a lot of the same <laughs> worries and fears come up there are some really common themes and what can tend to happen in particular in the crisis space and we, you know, if you think about yourself, if things have um, really, if you've ever experienced crisis in your life or at that real sense of urgency or distress, then often we have a tendency to catastrophize and uh, which is perfectly understandable in, a, in this situation. Um, if, you know, your child has just described <laughs> that they've been hurt sexually, of, of course, you know, you're going to feel absolute panic about what that's going to mean longer term and so it, it is really important for the child if we're thinking still keeping the child at the center of the work is that what can we do to support those adults around them that in terms of um, creating that safety and stability kids themselves don't have a lot of power to do that for themselves particularly younger kids so they need the adults in their life to be supported so that they can support them and one of the things that we do, um, not perhaps in the crisis space, but if we move into the therapeutic space with children, is that we provide that family work as well so that the, the family member is being um, supported and worked with in parallel to the child. And that's just so that, um, that for well, there's lots of reasons why we do that, but that the parents are, are supported. Well, it's really helpful for the kids and young people to know that the adult in their life is getting that support um, it can reassure them and it can often free them up to talk a wee bit more about their own stuff if they know that um, their parent or caregiver is getting that support um, and that you know the reality is is that the parents and caregivers are the long-term guiding presence in that child's life so even um, even in that crisis space that really is quite temporary um, even as you know for you to move into more longer term therapeutic work, really it's still kind of across a lifespan, it's a moment in time. And so the parents are the ones that are going to be there longer term. And also counselling or um, therapeutic support is kind of an hour a week and there's a whole bunch of other hours outside of that. So um, equipping the parents to be able to, um, to know how to parent through this, how to respond to their child in crisis, how to be a regulating force how to regulate themselves so they can be that for their child is is really important. Um, so, you know, as we've got there, to understand about how to regulate themselves through that, that hard stuff and then they can be a far more uh, stable force, I guess, for their for children in their life. And parents often just really need to discharge what's happening for them right at that moment. Um, they have a lot of concerns and questions about where to next you know, I think about the parents that we get that phone in when their child has just disclosed and they just have no idea where to go next. And, and so there's kind of that sense. If you think about that, um, the, the parallel journey of the fight, flight, freeze um, that is happening with the parent as well. So they're absolutely going through that same process in that moment. So it's really important that we um, contain them and equip them give them some structure, give them some guidance as to where to go next and often providing that structure is a really settling, mm. um, has a really settling effect. Um, speaks for itself, safe and meaningful social connection is the antidote for stress. Children need the adults to understand what's going on for them so that they can support them to get um, through their distress and as I mentioned that children need the adults to take care of themselves so that the children themselves don't feel that they need to that they don't have to protect their parents or rescue their parents so as you can imagine um, when this stuff occurs in the context of, of family particularly and we know that uh, the majority of it does um, occur in the context of close relationships 
children have real divided loyalty. Um, they want to protect their parents. They don't want to get people in trouble. Um, but they want this really yucky stuff to stop. So um, if, if the children know that the adult in their life has someone that they can talk to, that they um, are being supported, then that kind of takes that sometimes unconscious burden away from the children. And I think when it all comes down to it, you know, a child lives in a social context or a family context. And so um, if we're thinking about work one-on-one -on -one with the child, of course that's important. But I've always said that if I only had a limited resource, which clearly in the sexual violence sector we do, um, actually working with that family system is what the child needs. So, yeah. So hence what we've been saying all along. I know. The I immediate know. crisis is often not the child's. It's often the parents. Um, so yes, the child has experienced a really distressing, frightening, worrying event. Um, and there's no doubt that they are distressed by that. But they will be looking to their parents as um, a tell, really, for what, what happens next. So uh, if a child is really um, elevated and distressed and they talk to their parents and their parents become very elevated and distressed, then, then you know, they're looking to them as the guide of how, how do we do this. Um, and what will happen is that if commonly is that if they disclose and the parent responds um, in a particularly uh, sort of upsetting way, that may shut down any further conversation from the child. So if they tell, because as you will know, is it, it's very common for children to tell a wee bit, to throw a wee bit out there, uh, as a bit of a test of how, how's this going to go. So if they throw that, that out there and the adults in their life respond really badly, they may wind that back in and not say any, anything more. So we know that the parents can feel all of these things here, um, shock, anger, um, loss of control, triggered by their own trauma history. So that's a big one. We know statistically that there's lots of adults out there who've experienced some unwanted sexual attention in their lives and they go on to have children. And so, in and, and and I suppose, you know, very commonly what I get is when that happens, a parent sort of saying, this was, you know, if there was one goal that I had as a parent was to protect my child from this, something like this happening. And so when it does happen, they become really distressed and can often be triggered into their own trauma history. They can be frustrated by a lack of support or understanding from others. And that's, um, yeah, if, if you're one of the fortunate ones where this sort of activity hasn't touched your life, it can be quite hard to understand and connect with someone who's in distress over this. You can be compassionate and empathetic, but um, there's lots of people who don't really get it. Um, and, and also, I think, um, yeah, just the, the support that, um, that people... <laughs> You know, a parent might talk about this and other people don't know what, it's a bit like grief, they don't know what to say, they don't know what to do. And so the support that they might have expected is perhaps not as forthcoming. And if it's a family member, that can be particularly divisive. I just wanted to go back to that point about being triggered by their own um, trauma histories is that that is so much more common than we could have even imagined. Mm -hmm. We took a snapshot in time once of our parent group um, as to what you know, whether the parent, the families themselves, had experiences of sexual violence, we had a hundred percent at one point in time. So that was either a mother or a father in that family system. We had our school teachers. So it's really a biggie. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, you know, as I've said, that um, they can often feel that they've let their children down by not being able to keep them safe. You know, the perception of not being able to keep them safe. Um, that's really common. I think that we find that with the parent work that we do. Um, they're just devastated that, you know, that they didn't know, that they didn't see it, they didn't see the signs, as we talked about before. They're not necessarily looking for them. Um, confusion around the system. So that's that's a big one. They, um, particularly for those who, for whom they, the child has disclosed and they've put a call in to us as their first port of call and they haven't done anything else yet. Uh, and I talk through what the process is around um, where to next, whether that be a conversation with the child protection team here or with Oranga Tamariki. Uh, and that's, um, there's a lot of fear and confusion around, around what happens. And I'd say probably particularly with Oranga Tamariki, uh, there's a lot of fear from parents over what happens 
as they put a call into them. So as as you probably know and are well aware that, the, and the thing that I come up against most commonly is the public perception of Oranga Tamariki is very polarised. It's either at one end they do nothing, or at the other end they take your children away from you. Probably now more than ever, that's that has risen to the surface. And so, um, so to be able to actually step them through the process and provide some structure, and sometimes that means that I get them into the office. And we put that call in together, but I make the initial call and, and then hand the phone over. Um, so it's, again, it's around providing that structure, that scaffolding, that stability. Uh, and of course, they have that fear over um, telling other family members. So um, particularly pertinent if it is a family member who has done the harm, um, Parents are often very distressed around how do they have those conversations and what is it going to mean for that family, that family system as a whole. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I think you yeah, have covered some of cover this stuff this, anyway, yeah. but this is the this is I suppose when mm. we boil it down, the uh-huh. kinds of things that we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Just to listen is the big one. Just listen, let them offload, um, reassure them, normalise their responses. You know. If, if you put responses in the in the context, you know what what we're talking about here is a trauma informed response to to the people that we're working with. But if you put their responses into a trauma framework, then you'll commonly find that everything they're experiencing is normal within that framework. So, um, but it might not be completely um, abnormal and unusual for them. So, to be able to just normalise that, to settle them, stabilise them, help them navigate what happens in the in the immediate term, reassure them of of what comes next then talk about what happens in the future, but also it's around kind of titrating that information because as we know from a brain development point of view, a person in crisis it can only take information in, in small chunks. So, um, you know, it's important not to overload them with a whole bunch of information that they're not going to remember. But it, it might be, you know, as, we, as I've said there, to provide information in many different forms, so stuff that they can take away with them, I might send them an email to back up what we've talked about, might give them some websites to go to as well, just to in that in that first instance. So it's really all about um, providing that structure, settling them, providing enough information that they know the next steps, um, and and really just giving them an opportunity to um, talk through all of the mm-hmm. distress. And it might be that they just sit there and, and have a howl and a cup of tea and just have a moment to be able to process. Absolutely, and you'll notice the picture, which is quite significant too, which is breathe. And that's, mm. you know, as we were saying before about the complexity of this work, sometimes in the midst of this complexity, we're having to get back to real basics. So in a way, we're needing the parent or the caregiver to be this for their child, and we may well be needing to be this for the parent or the caregiver. So if we can be regulated, and that doesn't mean we don't just take care of ourselves at the end of the work day or the end of the work week or when we have our holiday, it's about during these sessions we're in, when we're in the presence of a distressed, traumatised person, mm. that we are being really attentive to our own regulation. Mm. We're, we're breathing. And what we know is that it's a bit contagious. So if we're calming ourselves down and our nervous system's a little bit more paced and, and calm, that's going to have mm. a, an effect on the person in the room with us. And we're modelling really what we need the parent to be doing for the child. Mm. Yeah, and, and even just, you know, simple tone of voice, how you pace your conversation and the tone yeah. that you use can have a really regulating effect. So, uh, you know, as I've um, spoken about um, Manaki Tanga, so being able to offer, um, you know, that the hospitality really, it might be, you know, food and drink and a, a hottie. You know, we look at... Um, uh, this from a sensory point of view, you know, I've, I've sat with a parent where I've gone and um, we have a number of um, hotties with lovely knitted covers at work and blankets and those kinds of things that, you know, that might seem a bit trite, but it's actually really important. You know, I've, I've filled a hottie and tucked it down the back of a parent and wrapped a blanket around them in that moment and, and handed them a, a cup of tea. And just from, you know, if we think about um, sensory processing from a sensory point of view, um, if they're really elevated, just to be able to be grounded and um, and to feel contained and warm and those sorts of things is really important. Um, whānau inclusion, um, you know, where where appropriate, um, you know, if they need bring as many people as they need to 
into that space. We obviously we attend to that and we give them choice. So we're not the only place. We we tend to be a bit of a one stop shop and that we kind of we have people coming in that we, we sort of gather them and then look at where to from there. But um it's really important that people have a choice as to where they go. Um yeah, the a referral holistic needs. So looking at what are some of the other things that are going on for them and you know, as a social worker, I look at a um, thing from a systems point of view. So, um, you know, what else is happening for them in that moment? This could be absolutely the straw that breaks the camel's back. They could be really um, in really dire financial straits or their housing might be really tenuous. So, you know, I might kind of go, okay, so, you know, this is what we're going to do right now. And then what do we need going forward? Um, so providing resources as well as you know, handouts, um, and I'll talk at the end about some of the books that we um, offer them the option of, of using with their kids. So giving them some resources to go away with, and sometimes people can feel, you know, a bit more equipped if they've got something in hand to go away with. Follow up, so um, checking in with them. And if they're doing what you say you're going to do. Yeah, 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 doing, um, you know, just don't over over promise and under deliver. Um, so if they need a follow-up phone call or, you know, to check that a referral has been made or, you know, what have you, just doing all of that, just the basic stuff that you would be doing anyway, and then partner with others to achieve safe responses. And you notice at no stage we're actually talking to the child. So what we're modelling is that if we contain and support you, and I know I'm sounding like a dog with a bone here, but mm. often people think crisis support with kids is going to look like having that child in the room. Now, it may well do in that, um, you know, emergency needs that kind of situation. But one of the challenges is if the child is in the room, then um, their understanding or their capacity to understand about what's happening here is a little bit more limited than in adults. So children can come and think, oh, gosh, is here another person who's asking the questions around what's happening. Is here, you know, that their capacity to understand where this bit fits in the context of further support. So quite often people aren't going to be able to get into immediate counselling. So that idea of bringing them in to meet one person to who, who they end up thinking, okay, who's this person, how this is going to work, and then for us to say to a child, um, no, no, I'm not going to be your person, so you go back over there um, until we get you your person, that can be quite confusing for kids. Mm-hmm. So again, it's about us trying to say, how do we support the person who's going to be your person until we can have, have that place either land? Oh, and yeah. it's also for um, parents to be free to say the things mm-hmm. that they need to. Because sometimes there's some pretty ugly stuff that needs to come out. Mm-hmm. And so it's not actually, it's not healthy for them to be uh, listening to that. No. And the other, uh, in saying that, that I might have a 16 or a 17 year old who does come in, actually. Um, so it's. Uh, so it is age appropriate. So it might be that um, the parent rings and, and says, this has happened, what do we do? Where do we go next? Uh, and they have a 16 or 17-year-old and we're appropriate. Mm. They might come in as well. I'll say, bring the, both of you come in. And part of the rationale for that too is that um, uh, if that child is going to end up coming to us for counselling, to have them come in the first instance can um, debunk some of the the myths or fears that they have around what counselling looks like and what we look like as a service, that they can just come at. I mean, we we haven't got a picture up here, but our service is um, located in a residential house in a residential suburb, so we just look like a house. So to have them come in and sit in a room or, you know, in the lounge room waiting space and see other people come and go, it kind of normalises that help-seeking behaviour as well. Mm -hmm. But also... um, to be able to have them come and give them a bit of empowerment and agency uh, and having their say. And also, um, you know, very often they're capable of understanding all the stuff that I might be talking about with a parent. And so um, it helps them to mm-hmm. be equipped with some of that information. And that that work is, again, boundary, which I think is, comes up on the next slide, because what you're not saying, because people can expect that when they're coming along, they're going to have to talk about what happened. Yeah. So often, again, it's about setting the, the parameters around that piece of work really clearly, which is we don't need to know what happened. We just need to know that you're going to be okay mm. and here are some things we need to do yeah. about that. And what, what do we need to do right now? Yeah. Um, so, you know, a big part of this work, uh, these are some important considerations that we could probably spend a lot more time unpacking, but just briefly, um, so all of those people supporting children, but, you know, particularly if you're in a professional space, 
uh, is being really cognizant of what your own values and experience and bias um, are in this area, and we all have them. So um, what is bringing what is that um, unconscious bias into becoming a conscious bias? So what are our own experiences in this? Have we had any? Have any family members had any? Maybe. Um, and also, um, how, how does that impact on how we do our work? And um, it's naive to think it doesn't impact at all, um, because it absolutely does. It's being aware of how that impacts. And if we're in the room with someone and we uh, become aware that we're being triggered, it's really important that we know what to do in that space and how to manage that. So just also, you know, some what is your own construct around this this particular issue. I think relevant to our own construct is to be conscious of our bias about the statutory agents. What do we actually think mm. about OT and what do we actually think about the others? Because they're really relevant to this mm. piece of work. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we talked about before having really clear boundaries and knowing your limits, um, knowing when you need to actually kind of tag out and get someone else to come in and, and give a bit of support there. And considering information sharing and mandatory non-mandatory reporting and all its variables. I mean, that's a that's a talk on its own just about. Um, but they are important considerations. So obviously we're working under new legislation now around information sharing. Um, we know that that information sharing change is, uh, the caveat around that is that it's in the best interests of the child, it has to be. So just being aware of what the um, information we are sharing or that we are seeking from from other people uh, and how we're sharing that, how we're holding that information. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just going to time the mind now. Um, <laughs> I've just got one still. Yeah, yeah. Well, one slide to go. Um, so the issue of, you know, we, obviously we don't have um, mandatory reporting as such, but in a professional sense, um, I mean, and this is, uh, you know. And if you're MSD funded. You if do. you're MSD funded, you do. Um, it's a, it can be a thorny issue. So um, you know uh, what we can, what we must never do is have someone say to us, "This has happened, and I don't want you to tell anyone, and you need to keep it a secret." We must never say, "Okay, I won't tell anyone." We can't do that, uh, and so we have to. We have to. There's a kind of therapeutic alliance that goes on even in that crisis space. And so we have to be mindful of that and how we support someone. But at the same time, we also have to be mindful of what our professional ethics are around this and that um, by keeping a secret like this or not telling anyone, we're actually not, we're, I believe we're causing further harm to that, that child or, or young person. So we have to be really careful. There's, there's lots of variables, and as I said, that's a whole nother talk, really. Well, and um, the thing is, you know, we do have a consult service, and I'm sure you may well have one in your own space. So that's the kind of thing people ring us about. So mm -hmm. if you're sitting in front of a client or you're becoming aware of a situation, more heads on an issue, the better. So we're really happy to take phone calls um, if you're sitting with a question mm -hmm. around, oh, what do we do? Yeah, Because that's the kind of stuff we do all the time. So don't hesitate to make use of that console mm -hmm. service because it's available for anybody. Yeah. So that's the importance of collaborative relationships and networks. <laughs> <laughs> Leave <laughs> no, them there. Yeah, yeah. Good segue. Um, so knowing what else is out there, um, who do we collaborate with and how do we work with them? And, of course, um, cultural considerations and competence. So um, in the first instance, you know, we, we work to a bicultural practice model. Um, so it's being um, absolutely aware of what, um, you know, getting some cultural supervision if need be. You know, we have that um, at start and it's really important knowing what your own competence level is. Um, but, you know, the cultural considerations around um, sexual abuse or sexual, sexual violence are, are really interesting in terms of... Um, and not only from, from a Māori and Pacifica point of view, but also, you know, we, if you're working with other cultures where this is an absolutely taboo subject, it's really important that you're aware of how you make this a, the approach to this work. Um, yeah. Should we go so, on to that yep. last? Yep. And then the last one is, um, so these are just some reading resources. Um, you'll notice that we've got um, Caps Hauraki there, and I understand we've, Got some um, Caps Hardaki people here um, as part of this webinar, so kudos to you. Thank you. 
Um, we use the resources that are available on their website um, and support to support parents around safety planning um, because often often parents kind of think, well, it's too late now, something's happened, so, you know, the, the, the horse is bolted. But we definitely talk about how do you actually, you know, this has come to the surface, how do you now revisit that place around safety and safe touching and what's okay and what's not okay and reiterate those boundaries or restore those boundaries or create them where they haven't been before. So these books that are here, are, these are kids' books, really. And so we will encourage parents to... Um, we commonly use everyone's got a bottom, as, as, but there's um, some secrets should never be kept. My body, what I say goes, also really good ones. And the Canadian Centre for Child Protection has got some good resources as well. And they've got this um, one for kids, it's Big Feelings Come and Go. But um, it's around having a, a conversation, this is really easy for younger kids obviously, um, around what's okay and what's not okay in terms of touch and revisiting that with them and helping them establish some safety networks as well. So. You know, who could you tell if this if this you know ever happens, and giving them a really good foundation of, of support people in their lives. Oh, nice. So, oh yeah, and oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, the other thing they haven't got on there is just around internet safety. Again, it's a there's a whole other talk, <laughs> um, but that is just becoming more and more and more relevant. So, having those conversations, a lot of the parents that I'm encountering. Um, are very naive themselves to um, what happens out there in the World Wide Web. And around how to protect their children from that. So apps like um, Family Link exactly. are ones that are used. Um, yep, directing them to NetSafe. Um, but there's there's a whole and also you know if kids have been sexualized early, then they may go looking for stuff online. So how do we protect them from that? From yeah. So I mean that again, that's a whole other talk. But it's also a lot of equipping parents and helping them understand um, what they need to do to keep them safe in the online world as well. Mm -hmm. And that's. Just a few contacts for you. We've done, and sorry we went over time, but yeah. um, I don't know if you still want to navigate some questions there, Miriam. Up to you. Kira, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, all three of you. It was, um, I, I personally found it really interesting and like just really valuable to go through all of those different elements. I think you did cover most of um, the questions, and I'm really happy if, if people, attendees, are keen to stay on for a little bit for q and A. I'm happy to carry on. So if you do have any questions, do put them through on the chat or on the question and answer box and we can answer them. Um, one question I had, and it comes a lot from the last comment you made around, um, you know, the cultural considerations and needing to have that really uh, around the topics and when they're taboo and how to work around that. I was also wondering, you talked before about the developmental stages. If you see some are there, is there any major differences in developmental stages across cultures? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess my experience really has been in terms of different, um, I'm thinking particularly of a, of a Pacifica family that I worked with. The, this the, this sort of stuff, this topic wasn't really talked about with the child. So that absolutely the first board of call was the was the parents, um, and and occasionally there was an older, much older sibling that was a part of those conversations. Um, but in terms of the the cultures, and also I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking also of uh, someone that we've got on our wait list at the moment, actually, who's from um, a particular African country and uh, the, the approach that we need to make around that. And she's, she's in that um, kind of teen age group and she doesn't want any conversations with her parents or caregivers at all um, because it's loaded with uh, a whole lot of other context that I'm not party to, really. So we have to navigate that quite carefully. Um, the, the, those conversations with parents are even more important, I guess, um, in different cultural settings is what I'd say, um, that the conversations are often not held directly with the kids. Is that your Well, I suppose what you're having to do, like in any situation, is spend some time getting to know their world. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, we have some knowledge around 
and, and that goes for, for their developmental world, their cultural mm. world, and get them to inform us in terms of how how this stuff works. And what because some cultural that. implications come from very closed systems that are say, highly religious families as well mm. have a really different cultural dynamic around sexual violence. That would be our experience and it is a struggle often with Pacifica families and that there isn't a Pacifica service for them mm. locally and this is just, there's very few Pacifica professionals locally who have comfort with the topic and so it is a real job to figure out how best to deal with it in each individual family setting. And I think... Get advice. Yeah, yeah, get advice, obviously. Um, But also, I think um, this is where you have some considerations yourself as a professional around self-disclosure. So my experience has been with Māori and Pacifica families that I've worked with, is that they want, they they see me in a professional role, but they want to know who I am. They want to know um, about my family, um, you know, that I think about that some Pacifica families that I've worked with, have I got kids? What do my kids do? How old are my kids? And so that's, you, you have to navigate those spaces as well in terms of um, your level of self-disclosure and your level of comfort with that in order to gain an alliance with the family. And I think often I would find as a rule, parent work, there is often more self-disclosure full stop than adult work because I think mm-hmm. that, you know, if you're able to align with them about how challenging the job of being a parent, even when there's not trauma involved, you're doing a lot to just go, hey, we're in this, you know, but this is a, this is a hard job. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I might sit here in this seat um, with some expertise potentially around this topic, but I, I could very easily sit in that seat with regard to this job as a parent because it's really hard. Credibility for parents is very bound in you. That's kind of like the calling card. It's not to say that people who aren't parents can't work with parents, but it is quite an obstacle to navigate and to just put on the table. Mm-hmm. Anyway, any other questions? Um, the last question I have is, you talked at the very beginning about what specific app their children are their own unique specific selves and we can't apply adult frames to working with children. Mm-hmm. Can you give us some concrete examples of what some of those that you hear, you've seen, you've observed um, might be? Um, I think sometimes that can, the approaches you might use, because children, for example, aren't necessarily always going to be verbal. So in terms of approach, is this what you mean? Yeah, so, so people are, are working in a much more of a play-based or a kind of a, an action-based or doing a puzzle together or, or doing things that takes the emphasis off the verbal, you know, verbal communication. Again, with, so in the crisis space, remember, we're not necessarily always working with the child per se, um, but it would be, for example, supporting the parent to go, okay, so you're going to want to talk about this stuff your child might not. In fact, your child might want to get on with being eight and that might involve going and playing with mates or, um, you know, not talking about this stuff. Um, So how do you as a parent um, look at developmentally what should be happening and um, support them to kind of do those tasks and we can go and go, well, if they're not talking about it, that's a problem. Whereas in actual fact, this little kid, it might not be a problem. But it also might. Drop and runs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, the drop and runs um, yeah. and the um, languaging. Yeah. You know, that, that's that's really important is equipping. Um, you know, a lot of parents don't, have, don't know what language to use around this when they're speaking with their children. So it's around equipping them with mm-hmm. some languaging. The drop and run is where they might make a statement around um, their noticings or observations mm-hmm. and then just leave it at that, put a full stop on it and not a comma, as I often say to parents. So they might go, hey, you know, I noticed you seem really sad today and I was wondering what that was about and then just leave it. And, and the child can pick that up or not. Um, but it's around how do they give messages to their child that the parent sees them and hears them. Yeah. And, and ultimately, um, take care of yourself as a parent. Because, you know, again, you'll get the theme, but a child needs for you to be in good shape. So this is not just if an adult turns up, then clearly our self-care is about them and about how do they, you know, resource themselves. When a parent turns up, the message is the same, actually. What your child needs is for you to be in good shape. 
So it's not being selfish to take yourself off to the gym or to have some time out or do whatever because, again, often parents can think, oh, no, no, my traumatised child needs me around them 24-7. Um, I need to protect them. I need to be doing all these sorts of things. Whereas in actual fact, your child needs for you to be okay and to kind of get messages that the world's actually, even though this horrible thing has happened, that the world hasn't suddenly become an unsafe place. So we're often relying on parents mm-hmm. to, to model, you know, how to be in the world, yeah. getting, getting that balance right. So that's, that's often different with regard it to It can be a strong children. temptation for parents to become overprotective, which is also hard. So getting that balance about, you know, what's a decent amount of boundary and, and what's just normal kid stuff that they should be free to do. And I think that's a beautiful note to end on of, you know, really supporting parents to remind children who have experienced anything not okay in their lives that the world hasn't suddenly become completely unsafe and that um, there's, you know, hope and possibility for recovery and healing and thriving. A, a lovely wrap-up statement for, for today. I would love, I really would like to thank all three of you your, for sharing your wisdom and expertise around um, this specific topic. I think there's been lots of conversations and it's a great starting point to no pun intended would start, but it's a you know a great moment to actually go. Okay, so what do we know as the baseline? Um, or what do we know as some really great practice to to start thinking on how do we progress as a sector to to be able to do better in the you know in the aftermath of children experiencing something like sexual violence. So thank you. It's I've I've taken a lot out of it, and I hope those on the called in and those who will watch the recording of this will continue to take a lot out of it. For those who are still in the chat, I have put a link for the feedback form. And someone has just said, thank you so much for your time and wisdom. And this helps affirm our work. So, yep, I think you did an absolutely wonderful job. And thank you. So if you would like to... Thanks, Mary. And you're a very good cheerleader. We feel much better now. We're (laughs) over our first (laughs) webinar. Well done. Well done. And if for those still listening, um, if you want to hear more from Start, let us know. Um, we'll see if we can get them involved into other webinars now that they've done their first one. <laughs>